Well, it's good to see you this morning. I'm so glad <clears throat> that you chose to be with us. As Ladarius just mentioned, I'm beginning a three-week series entitled The Seekers, Lessons from the Gospel of John. One section in particular from the Gospel of John, which I'm going to put up in the next slide, is chapter 1, verses 35 through 41. Now, if you've been coming to Cypress Valley for a while, you might remember that a year and a half ago, I started the Gospel of John. We had a series entitled The Light. That was about Jesus last fall. I did another series called The Witness in the next section, which is about John the Baptist. And this week, I'm starting another series in the next section of chapter one entitled The Seekers. Now, in particular, I have in mind uh, five extraordinary men. Here are their names. John the Baptist, Andrew, Peter, Philip, and Nathaniel. We'll be reading about them. You can read ahead in your Bible as you prepare to come uh, next week. So here's how this section begins. John 1, 35 through 51, starts with verse 35. Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Now the John here is John the Baptist. He's got two of his disciples. These are men that had been learning from John the Baptist and listening to John the Baptist before they saw Jesus, before Jesus showed up. And we're going to learn uh, that their names are Andrew and John. Andrew became one of the 12 followers and disciples, apostles of the Lord Jesus, as did John, who is the author of the Gospel of John. So John the Baptist stood with those two men, And looking at Jesus, Jesus was walking by and he stopped and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And notice the first line, again the next day. Meaning that the day before he did the same thing. As we read going back into chapter 1 verse 29, the day before Jesus came walking by and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one who can solve the sin problem of the world. He is the Lamb of God who will pay for the sins of the world. There he is. Behold him. And what John was trying to do was point his disciples to Jesus. He wanted his disciples to believe in Jesus for eternal life if they hadn't already. And then he wanted them to follow him in a life of discipleship. Well, these two disciples that day took John the Baptist seriously. And they started following Jesus. This, this day they followed him literally. They were walking behind him as he walked. It says the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Well, then Jesus noticed that somebody was behind him. So we read next that Jesus turned and seeing them following, he said to them, what do you seek? What do you seek? <clears throat> it's interesting to me that those words right there, that question, are the first recorded words in the Gospel of John. This is the first time John directly quotes Jesus, is in John 1, um, verse 38. Up until this time, John's been writing about Jesus, and John the Baptist has been talking about Jesus. But now for the first time, he quotes Jesus. And the first quote by Jesus in the Gospel of John is, What do you seek? Now, he says that to these two men, but I believe that John wants the reader, you and me, to take this personal, that as Jesus asked those two men, what do you seek? He's asking you the same question. What do you seek? Let me put that question up here all by itself. What do you seek? I want to digress for a moment and talk. I'm talking about Jesus and these two disciples. Just for a moment, I want to talk about Jesus and you. Because I believe that Jesus is asking you that question. What do you seek? What are you looking for in life? What would, how would you answer that question? What are you looking for in life? What do you think that most people would say in answer to that question? I've thought about it, and this is what I think most people would say, is maybe something like this. Well, I'm seeking happiness. Or I'm seeking to have a, a happy family or I'm seeking a good job and a good income, or I'm seeking good health. 
I guess that most people might answer one or all four of those. Those are good things. Nothing wrong with seeking those things. Those are good things to seek in life. It's happiness, a happy family, good job, good income, and good health. Now, what did those two men say when Jesus said, what do you seek? What do you seek? What's most important to you? What do you want most in life? And here's how they answered that day. They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say when translated teacher, where are you staying? Now, the word rabbi is the Jewish term. The word teacher is, of course, the English word. It's a translation of uh, what the Roman culture would have understood because John is writing not just to Jews uh, where they said rabbi. John wants the reader who could be anyone in the world. He wants the world to understand what's going on with Jesus so that the world would know about him and believe in him. That's why he translates it teacher so that we could relate to it. Teacher, where are you staying? Now you put that word teacher with where you're staying and answer the question, what do you seek? And you get the answer. What they were saying to Jesus is, we want it. what do we seek? We want it. We seek you. We seek to be taught by you. We seek for you to teach us. We want you to teach us about God. We want you to teach us about life. We want you to teach us about ourselves. We want you to teach us how to experience life to the fullest. So that's what we seek more than anything else. Now, hopefully you agree with me. That's, that's really a good answer. We want to be taught by you, Jesus. That's what we seek. Do you think you have a heart like John and Andrew? Do you think there's something within you that would say, yeah, that's really what I seek. That's really what I want most in life is to be taught by Jesus, to learn about him and to grow closer to him. You know, in the room this morning, I think there's, there's some of that in every one of you. You know why I think that? Because you showed up here this morning. That's why. Not everybody is here. There's a lot of people in Marshall that aren't here this morning. Oh, maybe they're at another church and they're seeking what you're seeking. But a lot of them aren't seeking to be taught and to learn and to grow closer to God, but you are. And I'm guessing if I asked you, why did you, why did you come in the room this morning? Why did you drive out here? Why did you choose to spend an hour out here at Cypress Valley Bible Church? I can't think of an, an answer that you would give except, well, I just want to kind of get closer to God. I want to connect with God. I want to be in a place where people are lifting their voices to him in song. I want to be around others that believe in him and be encouraged by them. I want to learn more of what God says in the Bible. So I want to say I'm glad you're here this morning because it tells me that your answer to the question, at least in part, at least to some degree, would be, well, I seek God in my life. I want to get to know God and be taught by God a little bit more each day. That's what they were saying to Jesus, except, wow, they were with him face to face. And they want to go where he's staying. They wanted to spend time with him one-on-one -on -one to let him teach them face to face on that day. So how does Jesus respond to their question uh, or when, uh, to their answer when he says, where are you staying? Their question, where are you staying? Here's what he said to them. Come and see. <laughs> I'm sure that Jesus was pleased with their request. Rabbi, we want to know where you're staying so we can learn from you. And he responded to their question, well, come and see. And that's the way Jesus responds to anybody anybody that wants to know him and learn from him is, well, come and see, I want to teach you. I want to help you to learn to grow, to know me and to know God, my father, in a deeper way. So he takes them to where he's staying. And here's what we read next. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the 10th hour. They went where he's staying, remained with him that day, meaning the rest of the day. John is careful to tell us when this moment began. It began about the, the 10th hour. 
What's the tenth hour? Well, in the Jewish culture, the tenth hour would be four o'clock in the afternoon because the day starts at 6 a.m. Uh, but for the rest of the world, uh, the tenth hour is 10 o'clock, just like it was this morning here in Marshall, Texas. 10 o'clock is 10 o'clock. The tenth hour is 10 o'clock. And John is writing to a world audience. He's not writing just for Jews. He's writing to communicate to the world the truth about Jesus. That's why he is saying to all of us today, this was 10 o'clock. This was the 10th hour. The, now, what's the big deal about that? That's just trivia. No, it's not trivia. It's to emphasize this point. They spent a lot of time with Jesus. It started at 10 o'clock. They spent the day with him, and it started at 10 o'clock. They got to sit at the feet of Jesus until, I don't know, 5 o'clock, 7 hours, 6 o'clock, 8 hours. I don't know if they stayed for dinner, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 hours, 10 hours. I don't know, but at least 7 hours if they just quit at 5. 7 hours plus of sitting at the feet of Jesus learning from Jesus about God and about life and about themselves and about how to experience the fullness of life. Wow, can you imagine spending a full day like that with just Jesus and him teaching you and answering your questions? It was amazing. It was, it was the greatest day of their life, I'm sure they would say, up until that point. And then we read about the name of one of them. I already mentioned his name. One of them who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now, Peter is more famous than Andrew. Peter's one of the most famous uh, disciples of all. You've probably heard of, of Peter. He had another name right here, Simon, Simon Peter, just like most of you have two names, right? First name and a middle name. Uh, I guess maybe that was his first name and middle name. I don't know, but the Bible tells us he was known as Simon, and he was known as uh, Peter. And the point is, he's Andrew's brother. So put yourself in Andrew's shoes uh, here for a moment. He just spent the day with Jesus, learning from Jesus. His heart is full. His mind is full of the truth, the wonderful truth that he learned from Jesus. And I want you to think with me for a moment. Wonder what the first thing Andrew would do after this day. A day spent by learning and growing closer to Jesus. Wonder what his priority would be when the day was over. I wonder what he thinks that, thinks that he should do first. We don't have to guess because we're told in the next verse. Andrew first, there it is first thing he did, he first found his own brother Simon, and he said to him, we found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. A day filled with learning from Jesus, what's the first thing he does is, that's on his heart, it's his brother. I've got to go talk to my brother. I've got to go talk to my brother Simon, his name is also Peter. I've got to tell him exactly what he told him. We found the Messiah, which is the Jewish term, which is translated the Christ, which was the Roman term, which is the term that uh, we're all familiar with. I've got to tell my brother. I've got to tell my brother who we found. He's got to know about Jesus that, that we've come to spend time with. Now, when he says we found the Messiah, which translated means the Christ, it's important for us to know what does he mean when he says we found the Christ. Many people, I think, when they think, well, what is Christ? And many people today, I think, would think, well, that's his last name, Jesus Christ. Like Bob Bryant, Jesus Christ. If you were to look up his phone number in a phone book, which we don't have those anymore, right? But if you were to look up his phone number, you'd look under C for Christ because that's his last name. No, that's not his last name. It's a title, Jesus the Christ. Now, it's shortened to say Jesus Christ, but he's Jesus the Christ. So now we need to think, and the reader of the Gospel of John should think, what's that mean, that he's the Christ? If it's not his last name, what's it mean that he's the Christ? And John would want us to keep reading through the Gospel of John to find out what it means that he's the Christ. And sure enough, we find a clear statement 
to tell us what it means that he's the Christ uh, in chapter 11. Let me show it to you. A woman named Martha said to Jesus, yes, Lord, I believe that you're the Christ. Now, she says this in answer to a question that Jesus gives her, which is stated in the previous verse. Whoever believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you're the Christ. So to believe this is to believe that he's the Christ. What is this? Whoever believes in me shall never die. Whoever believes in me has eternal life, everlasting life. It's life that you can never lose. It's life with God that you can never lose. You get it the moment you believe in me for it, and you'll never die spiritually. You'll never lose eternal life. Do you believe this, that I'm the one who can guarantee that, that I'm the one who can give that? She said, yeah, Lord, I believe that you're the Christ. In her matter-of-fact answer, she's saying that's what it means to believe that he's the Christ. He's the one that guarantees everlasting life just by believing in him for it. So with that as the definition, let's go back to chapter 1. Where, Jesus, where Andrew says to his brother Simon, we found the, the Christ, the one who gives everlasting life that you can never lose. And then he does, does something that's just so profound and important, and it's so simple. Here it is. And he brought him to Jesus. He brought him to Jesus. He wanted his brother to meet Jesus. He wanted his brother to believe in Jesus. He wanted his brother to experience Jesus. And so he brought him to Jesus. What could Andrew have ever done for his brother in his whole life that was more important than that? Answer, nothing. What could possibly be more important than bringing his brother to Jesus? That his brother might believe in Jesus for everlasting life if he hadn't already, that his brother might grow in his relationship with God. That's what Andrew wanted most for his brother, and he followed through by bringing his brother to Jesus. And here's what happens when um, Peter first meets Jesus. When Jesus looked at him, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. Again, Cephas is the Hebrew word, stone is the Roman word. Um, now we're getting, now, you know, when you talk about Peter, it could really get confusing because he didn't just have two names, he had three. Peter, Simon, and Cephas. Are you totally confused? Try not to be. Peter is also called Cephas. He's also called Simon. You can see it uh, right here. Now, when Peter says you are Simon, but you shall be called Cephas, or translated a stone. Let's think about the meaning of these words. The word Simon means listener, and Peter was a listener, and Peter, Jesus is saying to him, you're a, you're a listener, but if you keep listening to me, just like your brother Andrew, if you keep letting me teach you and you listen to what I have to say, you're going to someday be called a stone. You're going to be called a rock. You're going to be called someone who's got strength. Because Peter had a lot of weaknesses. When you read about his life, he stumbled and fumbled in many ways. But as he continued to grow, he became strong and mature in his depth of, 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 as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what Andrew has done is introduce his brother to someone who could not only give him eternal life, but someone that could change his life to make him a stronger, better man in the eyes of God and in the eyes of men. What a great thing Andrew did when he brought his brother to Jesus. In fact, I want to go back and look at the verse, just a part of a verse to kind of get the main thing I want us to see about Andrew. Here it is in verse 41. Andrew first found his own brother Simon, and he brought him to Jesus. You know, Peter's pretty famous, and he did a lot of great things as we read about him in the Gospels, the book of Acts. He wrote a couple of letters in the New Testament. 
Andrew, not, not near as famous as his brother Peter. He was one of the 12. But Peter's the one that, you know, we kind of learn most about or remember most about. Andrew's kind of, you know, not as well known. But I want you to think with me for a moment. Where would Peter be if it wasn't for Andrew? I don't know. Maybe God would have used somebody else to bring Peter to Jesus. But God used Andrew. So I'm asking the question in that way. Where would Peter be if his brother Andrew had never brought him to Jesus? It's a good question to think about because God did use Andrew to bring him to Jesus. And it, was, it, 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 it defines who Peter is and what Peter did. And he owed it all to his brother Andrew who told him about Jesus and brought him to Jesus. So I want us to think this morning, not just about Andrew. That's a nice story. I think we could say that's interesting. It's interesting to see what happened with Andrew, what happened with Peter. But the most important thing this morning is to ask, well, what does this have to do with you and me? Well, I think it has a lot to do with you and me. And it starts, I want to start by saying, here's how I think it applies to you and me. And that's for you to ask this question. Who is your Andrew? Who is your Andrew? Who brought you to Jesus? Now, if you have believed in Jesus for everlasting life, if you're convinced that it's true that God's given you everlasting life through Jesus and you believe the promise of Jesus, that he gives everlasting life to the one who believes in him for it, then you have an Andrew. Somebody told you about Jesus. Somebody did. Somebody brought you to Jesus in the sense that they told you about him and pointed you to him. Now, maybe you learned about Jesus at church through a preacher or a teacher, but somebody reached out and invited you to come and hear, to come and see. Somebody, God used somebody in your life to bring you to Jesus. And so that's why I mean when I ask the question, who's your Andrew? Can you answer that question? Who's your Andrew? You probably can. I know for sure I can answer it. I know who my Andrew is. And I'm going to tell you about her. And there's a number of you here in the room that have been coming to Cypress Valley for some time. And you're thinking right now, Bob's going to tell us about her again? Yep, I'm going to tell you about her again. Because if you've been coming here for any length of time, you've already heard about my Andrew, and you're going to hear about her again. And if you hang around here long enough, you're going to hear about her again someday. Now, I don't, I'm not ashamed of it. I'm happy to tell you about my Andrew. Now, some of you don't know who my Andrew is. You're going to hear it for the first time. Her name is Lynn Mulchin. Let me tell you how God used Lynn Mulchin to be my Andrew. When I was seven or eight years old, my mother took me and my younger sisters to swimming lesson at the lake. And the mothers sat on the shore and talked. And they talked about life. And she met Lynn Mulchin on the shore because Lynn brought her kids to swimming lesson. My mother didn't know Lynn Mulchin until they met at swimming lessons. And in the process of the conversation among the mothers, Lynn Mulchin invited my mother to her church. Now, we were already going to a church in the town near where we lived. Lynn Mulchin went to church. It was, you know, farther away. You had to go through my town to get to her town. But my mother said, well, I, Lynn Mulchin's a nice person. I guess out of courtesy, we ought to go visit. And whoa, when our family got to Lynn Mulchin's church, we heard a message different than what we were hearing in the church that we were going to. Because in the church that my mother grew up in, she was taught, and we were taught as her children, that to get to heaven involved two things. Jesus had to do his part, and we have to do our part. Jesus did his part when he died on the cross for our sins, and you need to believe that. And then you need to do your part by trying to live a good life. And that's what we were taught. That's what my mother believed. 
And my mother was depending on Jesus plus her works, and that's what we were learning. Believe that Jesus died for your sins and then do your part by trying to live a good life. But I'm telling you, when we went to Lynn Mulson's church, we heard a totally different message. We didn't hear that message. Now, we did hear that Jesus died for our sins on the cross. But we were told, we were taught, and we were shown from the Bible that to get to heaven, it did not depend on the life that we lived. It depended on Jesus and that we needed to believe in him as the one who gives everlasting life as a free gift that you can never lose once you have it. He who believes in him shall never die. Once you're saved, you're always saved. My mother heard that message and believed in Jesus for eternal life. My father heard it and he believed in Jesus for eternal life. And then I, as the oldest child, heard it and I believed in Jesus for eternal life. And then my sister and my next sister and our family was saved because God used Lynn Mulchin to bring us, to invite us where we could learn about the saving message of Jesus. That's my Lynn Mulchin. Who's your Lynn Mulchin? You've got one. And after you remember who it is, here's my second point. Thank God for your Andrew. Who's your Andrew? Thank God for your Andrew. Listen, my mother drilled this into me. Bob, thank God for Lynn Mulchin. Don't ever stop thanking God for Lynn Mulchin. I don't know where our family would be today if it wasn't for Lynn Mulchin. We were lost. And God used Lynn Mulchin to lead us to, to Jesus, to the saving message. And can you tell I haven't quit thanking God for Lynn Mulchin? Don't ever stop thanking God for your Andrew, for the Andrew in your life that brought you to Jesus, that brought you to him either personally or brought you to a place where you heard about the saving message of Jesus. And finally, here's the third thing. Be Andrew to somebody else. Thank God for your Andrew, but be Andrew to someone else. God wants you to be an Andrew to somebody else. God brought an Andrew to you. God wants you to be an Andrew to somebody else. God wants to use you to help bring somebody to Jesus, to believe in him, help bring somebody to heaven, to bring somebody to believe in him for everlasting life. He wants to use you. And for some of you right there, that's intimidating to you. That makes you nervous. That makes you afraid. And I want to help you to feel a little bit better about that. I want to tell you how simple this can be. I'm going to give you some suggestions as to how simple it can be for you to be an Andrew to someone else. First, here's the first thing I want to suggest. Tell them about the saving message. How do you do that? Well, you can tell them what you've come to see, what, what you used to think and what you think now. You can do that. You can tell them, just like my mother I used to think that I had to be good to get to heaven. Now I see it's just by believing in Jesus. He's the way. It's not what I do. It's just him. I've trusted in him alone for eternal life. You can tell them about your own testimony, or you can open up a discussion with a couple of questions that I use. I've found them very helpful. They're real simple. You can use these questions. I know you can. Uh, you can ask uh, your friend or your family member, do you know for sure that you're going to heaven? That's a good question. Then you listen to what they say, and then you follow it up with this question. Well, why do you say that? Why, why do you say that? If they say, uh, I know for sure I'm going to heaven, you should follow it up by saying, why do you say that? If they say, well, I'm not sure, then you follow it up by saying, why do you say that? That opens up a door for you to talk about the saving message. All right, so you can talk to them about the saving message, or here's a second suggestion. You can give them, here it is, you can give them the saving message. What I mean there is you can give them something to read about the saving message. And I have a couple of uh, little uh, booklets or tracts that I wrote to help you with that. Here's a picture of them on the screen. I've got them in my hand. This one here, the best news ever, that's the yellow one. Uh, this is an explanation of John 3.16. It's very simple, straightforward. You could say, you know, 
this has helped me. I hope it'll help you. I want you to have it. By the way, I've got lots of these out in the foyer. I'm optimistic this morning that you'll take a lot of them. There's more where those came from. I put a lot out there, hope that you'll take them and, and, and be an Andrew and, and, and share this with others. Okay, now the other booklet is uh, You Can Be Eternally Secure. This booklet goes through the passages where T Jesus talks about how you can know that you're eternally secure. And uh, these, either one of these pamphlets could really be used of God. They have been used of God. You, God can use you just to get it in the hands of someone else. You can be an Andrew uh, by doing that. There's a third item out there in the foyer that looks like this. It says Cypress Valley Bible Church on the front. I've got one of these in my hand. They look like these. These will actually fit in my wallet, probably in yours too. And what I like about this is it opens up and it's got pictures. People like pictures. Picture of the kids ministry, picture of the teens, and picture of adults. Uh, on the, on the, uh, when you first open, it's got a picture of this room and what goes on here. And then on the back, it says, at Cypress Valley, you will find. And it's got a list of things that people will find at Cypress Valley. I want to read through this. won't take but a, less than a minute to read it, okay? Here's what you'll find. And the reason I want you to listen to this is I think you would feel good about giving your friend this and letting them read this. Okay, here's what you'll find at Cypress Valley. Practical help from the Bible, encouraging music, quality nursery care, Bible-centered children's and teen ministries in amazing facilities, casual dress, except for Ladarius Carter. <laughs> it's on there, it's on there right there. All right, uh, no offering plates and friendly faces. Now, that, that will help your friend to say, well, maybe that's a safe place. And uh, you can hand these out, invite your friends. Now, this, this leads me to my next point, and that is invite them to church. I've already touched on it. You can invite people to church where they'll hear the saving message. A few weeks ago, uh, we had a baptism of James Goldman. And uh, James is six years old, and uh, he said something in his video that touched my heart. And some of you heard it, and some of you didn't. I want you to hear a part of what he said in his baptism video, because he's got an Andrew heart. His name is James, but he's an Andrew, because he wants to reach people for Jesus. You can hear it in his testimony. And he says he, he learned about Jesus at this awesome church, and he wants to invite others to come. And the way he says it is so cute, but it's so profound, and it touched, it, it'll touch your heart to want to be like James Goldman, who is like Andrew. Anyway, I said enough. Listen to, uh, listen to what James said uh, in this part of his video. I know that I'm going to heaven because um, I believe in Jesus for a lasting life. I learned about Jesus at this awesome church, and my mom and dad signed me up. And then I started loving it so much, I just, I really liked it. So if you don't believe, um, I'm going to invite you to kids' church, or you can sign up. If you don't believe, I'm going to invite you to kids' church where you can sign up. I just love it. And that's an Andrew Hart. He wants to bring people to kids' church where they can learn about Jesus and sign up for eternal life. I guess that's what he meant. Or just sign up to keep coming. I don't know. You do have to, parents do have to sign their kids in, so I think that's what he had in mind. Anyway, the point is, you can invite people to church, just like James Goldman wants to do or is trying to do. All right, I got one final suggestion for you, not just to invite them to church, uh, but invite them, here it is, invite them to church for something specific. Okay, I think it's good to invite people to church in general. Hey, sometime, come on out. Okay, that's a good invitation. Sometime, come on out. But I think it can also be good to say, this time, come out, specifically. And here's a couple things I have in mind. One is uh, Easter, okay? Uh, lots of people go to church on Easter that they don't go any other, 
there's lots of people that might be open or that are open to come on Easter where they might not be open at other times. So think about that. Easter's coming up here in a month or so. Think about who it is that you might invite to come for Easter. Second uh, specific event, if I could use that word, is a series I'm going to do after Easter, starting the first Sunday in April on the last days. What Jesus said about the last days in Matthew 24. The reason I'm pointing that out is I know that people are concerned about what's going on in the world. They don't know where the world's headed. And there's lots of people that wonder, what, is, what does God say? What does the Bible say? And I think this could be an opportunity for you to invite them specifically to a series like that starting in April. So you can keep that in mind. All right, so today we've begun our series entitled The Seekers. The key verse in this uh, first message is this. Andrew first found his own brother Simon and he brought him to Jesus. And I've encouraged us to take home with us these three thoughts. Here they are. Who is your Andrew? Thank God for your Andrew and be Andrew uh, to someone else. I hope that this has helped all of us uh, to do just what we read there, to be thankful for our Andrew and be Andrew to someone else. I'm gonna close in prayer in just a moment. I'll be up here at the front. If you have a question about the message, I'll try to answer it. Uh, if you just want to come up and introduce yourself, I'd love to meet you. And uh, let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you for Andrew. Thank you for Andrew and the Bible and the inspiration he is to us. Thank you for the Andrew in each of our lives that you use to bring us to Jesus. And help us to be Andrew to somebody else. Give us the courage and the wisdom, the opportunity to be Andrew to someone else. And for hearing that prayer and for the way that you'll answer and for the difference that it will make in each of our lives and the life of our church, we'll give you praise and we'll give you thanks. Amen. Thanks for coming. Hope to see you next week.